Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 12. <clears throat> we invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to today. And we're going to get ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. Well, time has run out for the ten tribes to the north. Come with me to 611 B.C. The Assyrian had been laying siege to Samaria uh, for three years, and Samaria finally fell. Uh, the ten tribes to the north, as I said, <clears throat> time has run out. And God gave them every opportunity to change. He sent prophet after prophet, rising up early in the morning and all through the day, sending prophet after prophet, warning the people of Israel, but they just would not listen. Uh, we're going to pick it up today in verse 12, but verse 7 pretty much sends up, sums up why God allowed them to go into captivity. That is because the people of Israel sinned against God and they feared or worshipped other gods. And with that introduction, and as I said, as we began chapter 17 in our last lecture, I pointed out what a beautiful chapter this is because the creator of the universe doesn't have to explain himself to anyone if he didn't want to, but he humbled himself uh, to explain to us why he allowed Israel to go into captivity. After all that they had done, and he had substantial reason uh, to allow them to go into captivity, but he still took time to explain. I think more than explaining to Israel that went into captivity, he's explaining to us today why he did these things. We're going to ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 12, and God continues to explain. Verse 12, For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Well, where did God say, You shall not do this thing? Well, you can start with the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, uh, verses 3 and 4. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, the Lord speaking. And then he continued on, Thou shalt not make a graven image to bow down to, to worship, in other words. Uh, Leviticus chapter 26, uh, the, verse, the chapter that tells us how to receive God's blessings, and how to receive his cursings. Verse 1 of chapter 26, he says, Have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make an image or a graven image to bow down to, to worship. Uh, he says, Don't do it. He meant, Don't do it. Verse 13, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah. Judah wasn't entirely innocent and without fault in this matter either. By all the prophets and by all the seers, this word seers, don't let that throw you. We're not talking about uh, someone, a fortune teller with a crystal ball, as you might think of when you think of a seer. A seer, check it out in your Strong's Concordance, is a prophet, uh, in this case, a prophet of the Lord. It can also be a prophet, a false prophet. This indeed, a prophet of the Lord, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statute. Do things God's way, not your own self-willed way, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. 
At this time, Jeremiah was prophesying against uh, Judah. Uh, God sent Isaiah and other of the minor prophets to prophesy against Israel. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 11, he tells the people of Judah, you know, time's running out. And it, there comes a time when it's too late for you to return to the Lord. Well, that time has come uh, for Israel, and it would be but a short 200 years later that Judah would also go into captivity uh, to the Babylonians. Verse 14, Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but harden their necks. This is a figure of speech that means that they were stubborn, like to or as the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. This goes back to that generation that lived when God through Moses delivered Israel out of the uh, hand of the Egyptians. Uh, that generation, the whole generation, did not believe in God. God promised them, I'm going to take you into the promised land, a land that flows with milk and honey. And when Moses was up on Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, what were they doing? They were melting down gold and making a golden calf to lead them. They didn't believe God's promises. They didn't trust Him. They didn't have any confidence in our Heavenly Father. Uh, over the uh, water, they continually complained. They complained about them having no food. And then when God fed them manna, they complained about the manna. We, we wish we were back in Egypt where we had uh, fish from the Nile and cucumbers and garlic and melons and on and on and on. And ultimately, as it's written in Numbers chapter 14, they tempted God some ten times. And that the, the straw that broke the camel's back was placed on the camel. And, and, and God judged that, that generation to die in the wilderness. You don't believe me, God speaking, that I can deliver you into the promised land? There is no promised land for you. Verse 15. Now we're going to have verses 15, 16, and 17. The word and occurs 16 times. It's called a polysendenton in the Hebrew language. Uh, those of you with companion Bibles, I believe it's Appendix 6, you can find that. But it adds emphasis uh, to each of these. The, the and tends to, to build the emphasis as you work through uh, the Scripture. Verse 15, And they rejected his statutes, speaking of Israel, the ten tribes, and his covenant that he made with their fathers, and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity, this means nothingness or emptiness, and became vain or worthless, and went after the heathen that were around about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. He told them, don't give your daughters to their sons, don't take their daughters to your sons uh, to wife. And if you do, you're going to end up worshiping their gods. God knew exactly what he was talking about. It did come to pass. But their whole life was worthless in regards to the most important thing in their life, what should have been the most important priority in their life, which was their relationship with their Heavenly Father. They continually rejected Him. Now He has rejected them. Verse 16, the polysendenton continues, And they left off all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. All the host of heaven is the worship of the sun and the moon and the stars. And of course, the Baal worship, the, the primary one who turned 
the hearts of the children of Israel towards Baal was Ahab and Jezebel. They, they closed down the temple of the Lord and opened up a house of Baal in Samaria. And their daughter, Athaliah, would do the same in Jerusalem in later years. Man always trying to create his own salvation, his own religion. Uh, God told us in his word, he told Israel in his word, how they were to worship him. They would not listen. The polysendenton continues in verse 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech. Uh, God said at one place in the Old Testament, how could you do that? Uh, you pass your own flesh and blood through the fire. That, that thought never even crossed my mind, the Lord said. And used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Divination and enchantments is to uh, entertain uh, evil spirits, often referred to as familiar spirits in the Old Testament. And you take Saul, the first man-king of Israel, what caused God to reject him as the first king of Israel? Well, it's he sought out a familiar spirit in the witch of Endor uh, to summons up the spirit of Samuel so Saul could seek counsel from him. You don't try and contact the dead. Uh, God does not like it. He won't tolerate it. He re will reject it. Verse 18. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel. and He had every right to be and remove them out of his sight. They rejected him, now he's rejecting them. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. And of course, Judah only includes the Levites, which most of them, the priests and the Levites, were assigned throughout all the nation of Israel. Uh, they were divided up amongst the 12 tribes. But when Jeroboam made the two golden calves and put one in Dan and one in Bethel, the Levites and the priest uh, moved to Judah. Uh, they knew what was coming for Israel with falling away in apostasy like that. <clears throat> Judah would also include uh, the tribe of Benjamin at this time. And again, Judah is not completely without fault at this time either. You had the likes of Ahaz, uh, the, the king of Judah, as well as Athaliah who reigned over Judah for a while, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, captivity for Judah is some 200 years away at this point of the time of this writing. Verse 19, also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. <clears throat> statutes of Israel, yeah. Verse 20, And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel. Here we have a, a prophetic anticipation. And afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of spoilers, until he had cast them out of his sight. Not what he wanted to do at all. He wanted to be the king of Israel, but they insisted on having a man king like the heathen nations, a king that they could see with their own two eyes. And, and this is very beautiful here as to why God uh, rejected Israel, but I wanted to go at this time to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. Just one verse there in Jeremiah. Most of you know that the Lord married uh, Israel, or Jerusalem, I should say, in Ezekiel chapter 16, oh, along about verse 4. But did you know that he divorced Israel? Well, he did, and, and the reason he divorced her, we've been reading about it in chapter 17 of 2 Kings. One verse, chapter uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. And I saw the Lord speaking, 
when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, that's idolatry, worshiping other gods spiritually, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Some 200 years later, Judah also would go into captivity. Israel to the Assyrian, Judah to the Babylonians. <clears throat> Back in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 21, for he rent Israel from the house of David. And this is a very appropriate wording here. You remember Ahiah the prophet when he approached Jeroboam? What did he do? He rent his new garment in 12 pieces and told Jeroboam, you take 10 of these pieces, each piece representing one of the tribes of Israel. God rent Israel uh, from the house of David. Uh, due to Solomon's idolatry. And they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. This stated a sin, a great sin for emphasis. And of course we're talking about the two golden calves, uh, also the fact that he was appointing his own priests, not Levites, not uh, of the house of Aaron as far as the priest were concerned, which was required by God's law, but he would just take any of the lowest sort would do and promote them to the priesthood. And he drave Israel from following the Lord. Verse 22, For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them. Some 19 kings since Jeroboam to Hosea, the last man king of the 10 northern tribes, uh, covering some 269 years. And they just could not break away from the sins of the first man king of the 10 northern tribes, Jeroboam, the calf worship. 23, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. He warned them time and time again. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And unto this day, including unto the time of this day. And, you know, there were some 27,290 of Samaria taken captive which doesn't sound like a great number compared to the whole number of the number of Israel. But the king of Assyria did a good job of decapitating Israel because he took the best and the brightest to Assyria and left what was left uh, in the land of Israel. You know, this captivity to the Assyrians would last uh, not a great number of years, but uh, it went on for a, a, a while, but it did come to an end. And what happened when that captivity ended? Well, you can read about it in books that we offer here at Shepherd's Chapel. Uh, the uh, uh, to, uh, discover, ancient discoveries in the Assyrian tablets, which covers uh, what happened at the end of the captivity and uh, also, Abrahamic covenant goes into that to some extent. But some of the ten northern tribes returned home, but a far great number of them went north from Assyria and crossed the Caucasus Mountains, becoming known as the Caucasian peoples of the world. Uh, they settled in Europe, and then many later migrated on to Canada and to the United States. Uh, that is, and you know, the, the unfortunate part about that is that most of them don't have a clue who they are this day. First, God knows who they are, but they don't. Verse 24, and there's a lot of empty houses in Samaria and Israel. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, like there wasn't enough confusion already 
in the land of Israel by all the idolatry that was going along. Babylon, by the way, those of you who don't know, if you translate it, means confusion. And from Kuthath, and from Ava, and from Hamath. And this is, uh, should bring a bell with the land where the many Kenites resided. And from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. God took the cities and the houses, the wells, the vineyards, the olive yards away from the Canaanites and gave them to the children of Israel. Uh, the promised land, a land that flowed with milk and honey. Well, for the 27,290, there is no more land that flows with milk and honey. Uh, the heathen colonists are enjoying uh, what God promised to the children of Israel. <clears throat> and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. They didn't revere the Lord. They didn't worship Yahweh. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Now, the Samaritans, which they became known as, uh, particularly in the New Testament, were a mixed bag. We saw in verse 24, they came from Babylon and Kuthath and Ava and Hamath and Sepharvaim. Uh, some of the residents of Samaria and Israel were of Israel. So you had a mixed bag of races of people, you had a mixed bag of nationalities of people, and you had a mixed bag of religions of people. Uh, some In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 8, Isaiah prophesied that in 65 years the, the power of Ephraim would be broken, and that prophecy came to pass. Ephraim uh, being the larger of the ten tribes uh, the name being synonymous with the ten tribes of Israel. Verse 26, Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria. These are the people, uh, the mixed bag of people who were inhabiting Samaria and the land of Israel that the lions came among. They spoke to the king of Syria, Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay him, because they know not the manner of God of the God of the land. And this is typical heathen logic. <coughs> Excuse me, you, you don't keep a God no matter where you go, according to the heathen. Each land has a God that controls it. You remember uh, Benadad at the time of Ahab uh, went up against Ahab and Israel thumped their gourd pretty good. And the advisors to Benadad said, well, it's because they have a god of the mountains that we were defeated. And if we'll tomorrow, we're going to fight them in the plain or in the valleys and then their God won't be able to secure the victory for them. Well, when God heard that, it made him angry because he's not a God of the mountains. He's a God of the, the universe, the heavens and all the earth, mountains and plains and valleys included. <clears throat> Verse 27, Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence. Send one of the priests that you brought from Samaria to Assyria back. And let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. God had already rejected the worship of the priests of Israel. They didn't have a clue how to worship the Lord. They were too busy worshiping the other gods of the heathen. So you talk about the blind leading the blind here. 
the king of Assyria is sending one of the priests that failed miserably back to teach the people uh, how to worship the Lord. Verse 28, Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, one of the locations where they had a house that they put the golden calf in, and taught them how they should fear the Lord, how they should revere the Lord. And you talk about falling in a ditch. When you've got someone like this leading you, they're going in a ditch, and if you're following them, you're going in the ditch with them. 29. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. Israel, uh, what was left of the ten tribes in the mixed bag of heathen colonists. Every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. Uh, the priest must have forgotten the part about thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that shouldn't be surprising because that's what was going on in Israel that brought about the captivity to begin with. But I think I find humor in the fact that the king of Assyria would send one of the priests who had failed to teach the people how to worship the Lord back to teach the people how to worship the Lord. Verse 30. We have another polysendent in the word and emphasizing each addition to the first statement. And the men of Babylon made Sakuth Benoth, and the men of Kuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamoth made Ashima. Each brought his own gods or made up his own gods. Sakuth being a word most of you uh, probably recognize as being booths is the meaning of the word. And from the time of the first uh, when Israel came out of, of Egypt and their first place of encampment, was called Sukkoth because God instructed them to make booths uh, which were symbolic of God's protection for his chosen children. But Sukkoth Benoth means daughter's booths. And what they had was a little box that had curtains, cloths over it. And two people could easily carry uh, the pallet containing the box and the curtains, and then inside of the curtains you would find uh, Astarte, <coughs> Nergal, on the other hand was some say Mars, uh, the god of war. Some say it was a male chicken, a rooster, if you will. But you, you see this mixed bag of religions uh, brought into Samaria. Uh, Jesus himself would say in John chapter 4, verse 22, uh, to the Samaritan woman that had five husbands, and he said, and you're not married to the man that you're living with now. He said, I perceive that you worship, ye know not what. And that's what's going on at, as we read these scriptures. And the Avites, continuing in verse 31, made Nibhaz, a dog became their god, and Tartak, uh, that they made an ass their god. I question the intelligence of someone who would make an ass their god. And the Sephirvites burnt their children in fire to Ad Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of the Sephirvaim. And these two, Adramalek and Anamalek, uh, related to Molech, uh, which was where the people would sacrifice their own children by fire to the god Molech. <clears throat> Verse 22, so they feared the Lord. They, they acted like they were revering and worshiping the Lord. Why? They wanted the lions that had been sent among them to go away and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priest of the high places. Just anyone will do. They weren't particular, kind of like uh, Jeroboam, which sacrificed for them in the houses of 
the high places. Illegal uh, worship of the Lord would not be accepted by the Lord. But they thought they could get away with keeping their ass gods and their dog gods and worship Yahweh as well. And that way they could please everyone. Well, that didn't please Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. When he said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, he meant it. Verse 33. They feared the Lord, again, only in an effort to keep the lions out of the land, and served their own gods, small g, after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. <clears throat> Verse 34. Unto this day they do after the former manners, uh, the Israelites that remained in the land. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances, the statutes and ordinances established by Yahweh, or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. When Jacob wrestled the angel of the Lord at Penuel, which means translated the face of God. God renamed Jacob at that time Israel. And again, most today don't have a clue who they are. Now, and what was the promise that God made to Abraham? His promise was, I'm going to make your seed as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Well, that's a lot. Where are they? Well, the, if you added the people of Europe and the United States and Canada, you would be pushing those numbers. That's where the descendants of Jacob, a good part of them, ended up, uh, often called the lost tribes of Israel. Well, God didn't lose them, they lost themselves. Verse 35, with whom the Lord had made a covenant, and the covenant was conditional on obedience to him. They failed miserably, and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. And he takes that very seriously. He states in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, you should have no other gods before me, for my name is Jealous. And that's Jealous with a capital J. Uh, if you want God's blessings, you do things His way. If you want Him to reject you and cast you off as He has done Israel at this point, uh, don't do things his way. That's, that's the way it is. So we'll come back and see how this turns out in our next lecture. Uh, we won't have any more confusion about who was the king of Israel and who was the king of Judah at the same period of time because from this point on through the rest of the kings, we're only going to be talking about the kings of Judah. Why? Because there are no kings of Israel after they went into captivity to the Assyrian. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. 
If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. We teach God's Word in a positive format, uh, throwing out negative about others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Uh, quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need a telephone number. We can do away with it. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I encourage you to talk to your Father. You know, I don't think you have a lot of competition these days. Everyone's so busy uh, running around in this world. Uh, it seems like the confusion is rampant. Uh, but that's written, so that shouldn't surprise us at all. But talk to your Heavenly Father. It makes His day. And when you make his day, he can make your day. And by that, I'm talking about blessings. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. And we have illnesses in families, Father. We ask that touch of healing, uh, financial difficulties, Father. You know their needs. If it is your will, a special blessing on each of these we also remember and lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, touch, protect, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up today, Thomas in California. <clears throat> if we were in the first earth age and now we are in the second age, uh, would that be reincarnation? No, uh, there was no flesh man in the first earth and heaven age. Uh, the womb uh, was not involved in the first earth age, only in this, the second earth, heaven and earth age, uh, and man is in the flesh here. But as it's written in Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed to man but once to die. And, and, and I know that's a common misunderstanding when people first hear uh, when we're teaching about the three earth and heaven ages that, that we were lived in them and we lived in the second and we're going to live in the third. Some of us, uh, they're thinking, well, that's reincarnation. They're thinking flesh, not spirit. You know, we live one time in the flesh, one time only. Jacob from Florida, uh, I wrote these questions a while back, but they have not been answered, so here goes again. Well, you, you, you're, you're fortunate. Your questions are going to be answered. I know dedicated Christians who serve God uh, pray to God, and God answers their prayers, yet they believe and are expecting to be raptured before the great tribulation starts. Why has God not revealed the truth to them so they will not be deceived by the false Messiah? Or will God reveal this to them at that time? Uh, these are not lukewarm Christians. Well, uh, many Christians have a spirit of slumber placed upon them, as it's called in Romans chapter 11, verse 7. And, and God has blinded many for their own protection. You see, what is the unforgivable sin? It is for someone to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan. And if you don't know that, uh, if you don't know that, that the, the, the truth you can't commit that sin. You see, it's only God's election who can commit that sin. So uh, Isaiah chapter 29 also states that, that many uh, are, are blinded. Uh, they take the book, which in, in the, the text reads, the revelation uh, to someone who is supposedly learned. 
and they say, here, read this. And he says, I can't, it's sealed. And that's what you hear today. The book of Revelation is sealed. We're not supposed to understand it. Beware of anyone who tells you there's any part of God's word that we shouldn't study to understand. Second question, a lot of people uh, consider their pets as part of their family, especially dogs and cats. And when they die, they are so much missed. Is there any evidence in the Bible to suggest that God will bring back their beloved pets back to life, especially people who all they had was their pet? I ask because there will be animals during the millennium, according to the Bible. Will these pets be part of the animals during the millennium? Yes, I believe so. And uh, Jacob is referring to Isaiah chapter 11, which is uh, after the Lord has returned. In other words, there is no flesh at that point in time. But there are animals there, and the fact that there is no flesh is the reason that the wolf can lay down with the lamb. No carnivorous animals. <clears throat> Mary from North Carolina. Where or how many years is man given to live in the Bible? Well, you can find uh, in Psalm 90, verse 10, it states there that our days are three score and ten. A score is 20, so three score would be 60 years plus 10. Our days should be 70 years. And then it continue on there in Psalm 90, 10, if by strength, maybe, 80 years. Not everyone lives that long. You know, we're not guaranteed any number of days. Uh, we are promised that some things that can cause our number of days not to be so long. Uh, one of those is not honoring your mother and your father. Uh, cursing your mother and father can cause your days to be shortened. Charlene in New Jersey. I work with a nice lady and she told me that she was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, uh, a muscle disease. My heart was moved with compassion to pray for her healing from my Heavenly Father. Uh, the next day we were talking and she told me that she was a believer in the Koran and that she was a Muslim. Instantly, my heart was alarmed as I remembered uh, you warning about somewhere in the, the epistles of John not to wish someone of a false doctrine God's speed. My question, did I do wrong by praying for her? Thank you for your answer. And no, you did nothing wrong in praying for her. Uh, number one, you're a compassionate person. You know, I've often uh, noticed that uh, that is one of the uh, uh, attributes or characteristics, better word, of God's elect. You're compassionate people. And you didn't know at the time that you prayed for her that she was a Muslim. But uh, uh, again, you did nothing wrong. Don't sweat it. Tanya in Missouri, when a person forgets stuff, does God call them rebellious? No, rebellion is when you know what God wants you to do, but you purposely go the other direction or do the opposite thing. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 26 is one of the first examples of man rebelling against God. Unfortunately, there are many, many, many more. Mary in Florida, what did Jesus mean in John 14, verse 28, when he said, for my father is greater than I? In other words, at that point in time, uh, what was Jesus? He was in the flesh. Uh, he was the son of man, which is a title uh, given to Jesus when he was here on earth in the flesh. Uh, I'll give you a scripture in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It states of Jesus, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. 
and was made in the likeness of men. He did that for us. Why? Because the price had to be paid on the cross. He, he became a servant to all uh, by giving his life uh, for uh, his fellow man. And, you know, th there's no greater love that someone can give than sacrificing themselves for their brothers. And I, you might say, well, I didn't know we were brothers to Jesus. Well, he called us as much if you're familiar with his word. Sherry in Illinois, please explain evil spirits I don't understand. Well, some spirits uh, serve God and some serve its demonic ser spirits uh, serve Satan. And, uh, you know, demonic spirits can take possession of an unwitting flesh body. Uh, Jesus gave us power over all of our enemies, including these evil spirits in Luke uh, chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, if we order them out in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that last part that's the most important. It's not your power to uh, defeat the enemy. It's Jesus, the power of Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ. Stephen, Virginia, what do you do to turn your life around when drugs and everything is in your way? And every time you turn around, someone smacks you down. You want to do right, but wrong is always there. Thank you. Well, first of all, get clean. And if you're not able to get clean on your own, drug-free, in other words, uh, seek help. There are uh, helps out there for those who are addicted to drugs and want to get sober and clean. You know, drugs rob you of your mental uh, faculties, your capabilities, if you will. You can't think clearly. You, you can't even know right from wrong when you're on drugs. Drugs generally connect you with the wrong people, the wrong crowd. And peer pressure is a, a great influence, especially on youngsters today. Uh, another thing that you can do is mature as a Christian. Because as you, as we mature as Christians, uh, we become, our priorities become different. Uh, serving the Lord becomes a much more important priority than serving ourselves by getting high on drugs. Get clean. Aaron in Utah, thank you for your work. You're welcome. Uh, the verse by verse Bible study is awesome. We're glad you're enjoying this, the program. When is the Sabbath day? I want to honor my maker on the right day. I understand this commandment to be important and still applicable, right? Question, isn't Saturday the Sabbath? Is it from dawn until sunset? Question, well, you're right. The Hebrew day begins at sunset. Uh, for example, the Passover, uh, as according to Leviticus 23, begins on the 14th day after of Abib, the first month, uh, at evening at, at dusk and now the the day of the week you know sabbath if you understand the word in the languages means rest and in hebrews chapter 4 we learn where we christians should put our rest it's in jesus christ you know he became our high sabbath our passover as it's written in first corinthians chapter 5 verses six and seven. So uh, we here at Shepherd's Chapel, we put our rest in Jesus every day. If you don't put your rest in him, you have no rest, no peace, if you will. Rebecca from Mississippi, I am 10 years old. I was wondering since we were spiritual before we were flesh bodies, was Jesus in a spiritual body before he was born in the flesh? I watch you with my grandmother, and I wanted to thank you for teaching me the truth about the Bible. Well, you're sure welcome, and I'm so pleased that you enjoy studying God's Word. Yes, Jesus was 
uh, from the beginning. And of course he was in a spiritual body as all of us were in spiritual bodies. We were all created in spiritual bodies in the first earth age. Uh, what happened? Well, one third of God's children followed Satan when Satan rebelled against God. And God had a choice. He could have def uh, uh, pushed a button or whatever and caused one third of his children to die uh, for good, their soul to be extinguished out. But he didn't want to do that. That's the reason for the second earth age. Uh, all of us were to be born one time in the flesh and have an opportunity once again, will you follow God or will you follow Satan? And Rebecca, I know you and your grandmother have chosen to follow God. That's the reason you study the letter he wrote to you, the Bible. God bless you and your grandma. Sally in Nevada, how do you find a church that teaches like Smyrna in Philadelphia without attending them? Well, there's nothing wrong with visiting a church to find out what they do teach. Uh, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, you could, I guess, ask for the church before you went for a copy of their statement of faith. Uh, most churches have a document prepared that's called uh, the statement of faith. We certainly do here at the chapel. And it, it outlines the basic precepts of the teaching of that church. Hopefully it's a teaching church. Many, unfortunately, seem like they're into the traditions of men and man's words rather than God's words. Ronnie in North Carolina, did Jesus die death of the flesh only or did he pay with his soul as well for us? No, his soul resurrected, his spirit resurrected and his death was in the flesh only. Uh, unlike the rest of us, though, his flesh did not see corruption. Why? Because God didn't allow it to see corruption. He was in that tomb for three days, and praise God, he resurrected uh, from the dead. Uh, his body was transfigured, if you will, uh, much like Enoch and Elijah, and I, I'll throw Moses and it's that as well. Uh, actually, no soul is dead at this point in time, Ronnie, uh, not even Satan's. Now, Satan's soul is judged to the second death. That's the, the death of the soul is what I'm talking about. Uh, that happened in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. When will that be accomplished? When the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20 is complete and the lake of fire is opened up. Satan, the devil, is going into that lake of fire and those who choose to follow him will also follow. Jane in Florida, doesn't Absalom's rebellion teach us not to have civil war? Uh, David, who fought Goliath with a slingshot, knew that he must run away uh, because staying would have resulted in civil war. Doesn't God forbid civil war? In other words, David uh, left Jerusalem uh, rather than staying and having a bloodbath in the capital of Judah, actually the capital of the entire nation of Israel at that time because the nation hadn't split then. But, you know, God does not like uh, brother fighting against brother. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Uh, when Israel was finally on their way and decided to, to make their way from Egypt to the promised land, uh, they came up to the land of Esau, Edom, and they wanted to cross the land. And they sent to the king of Edom and said, you know, uh, we're not going to veer to the left or the right from the king's highway. We're not asking any great thing. Uh, let us just go through your land. And if we use any of your water or take any of your food, we'll pay for it. Well, Edom said no, 
and it kind of made Israel mad and they wanted to, uh, they asked God, can we fight with them to cross? And he said, no, you don't fight against your brethren. Now to say though that God forbids uh, civil war would not be accurate either. <coughs> Excuse me, in our recent uh, lesson, we had Pekah, the king of Israel, uh, God used him to attack uh, Jerusalem, Judah. Why? Because of the antics of Ahaz, uh, the king of Judah. So God can use whoever he wants uh, to chastise. And God did allow Israel to attack the Moabites and the Ammonites when they attacked them as they finally did make it toward the Promised Land. <coughs> Excuse me, Dick in California, uh, thank you and your staff uh, for your teachings over the years. I have learned a great deal from watching your program. In the beginning, we learned that all soul spirits were created in the first earth age, but there were no humans, and that it was God's desire for, again, all souls to be born innocent through women, and that some fallen angels refused to be born through women. In the meeting of Jesus and Nicodemus, Jesus tells him that unless someone is born of spirit and, and born of water, he can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And I'm not going to have time to answer that, Dick. I'm going to promise that that'll be the first question when we come back in our next lesson. I don't want to rush through it and, and leave anything that's important in the answer out. So uh, with that, I'm going to tell you that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know, it makes Father's Day when he looks down and he sees you reading the letter that he wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, beloved, it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.